and uh, this is applied depth sensing. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to give you some motivation for using depth cameras in robotics. Uh, we're going to uh, go over the landscape of uh, depth sensing technologies that are available right now, and we'll finish with some real-world application and the raffle. So before we begin, uh, a couple of words about us. RealSense is a business unit inside Intel, developing advanced computer vision solutions. Uh, my team is uh, managing the, our SDK on GitHub. We are completely open source. We run on all the major operating systems and support a bunch of different languages and uh, frameworks. So you're welcome to check out LibreSense on GitHub. Um, just for a show of hands, how many people heard of RealSense? Nice. And how many of you uh, tried it? Cool. So feel free to shoot a, an issue at us at GitHub if you have any problem. Uh, with that out of the way, um, let's talk about depths and robotics. So we know that computer, uh, computer vision can be used to solve many problems in robotics. And uh, we at Intel believe that understanding the world in 3D is not only useful, but actually necessary to solve those problems well. Now to give something more tangible, um, this is from a heavy robotics presentation at IROS. The two robots are completely identical, except the fact that one of them is operated manually by a human, and the other one is autonomous, driven by a depth camera. I'll let you decide which is which. And they're trying to pick up these bini bags. <laughs> <laughs> So I hope I captured your appetite. Uh, with that, uh, let's continue to the wide overview of depth sensing. So there's many, many solutions of de uh, for depth sensing. Um, one major takeaway that I want uh, you to leave uh, uh, this uh, talk with is that there's no magic bullet. There's no one technology that works best and each of these different technologies rely on some different uh, uh, solution, different gimmick, and uh, provides different benefits and uh, drawbacks. But uh, the three major families of uh, depth sensing that are actually productized and selling today are based on time of flight, structured light, and stereographic uh, depths. So first, let's get uh, time of flight out of the way. This is a huge topic that deserves a talk uh, of its own, and we might give one sometimes later this year. Uh, but for now, uh, the idea behind direct time of light is that we have a sensor and we're sending a light pulse to the object, and we measure how much time it takes for the light pulse to get back to us, divided by two, divided by speed of light, and we have our depth. And indirect time of flight is doing something fairly similar, but it uh, takes advantage of uh, polarized light and of uh, phase shift together with some post-processing to estimate the depth data. Now the benefits of time flight, it's a very straightforward technology. Uh, it can scale to longer ranges. Time of light uh, struggles with interference from ambient light sources. For example, if you take it outdoor, uh, outside uh, in the sun, it can mess up the returning, uh, the returning pulses. And for the similar reason, it uh, struggles with interference from uh, multiple cameras, multiple time of flight cameras. The, the different cameras will interfere with each other. The cost of time of flight is all over the place. 
you can have uh, sensors for tens of thousands of dollars, but it's generally going down and uh, reaching consumer you know, affordable levels. <coughs> the main problem with time flight is the problem of power, because in order to get, uh, to get a single depth frame, you have to illuminate each and every pixel. And as a result, uh, resolution is often sacrificed to have less pixels and save on power and cost. Yeah, I'm not covering all the different, uh, uh, but yeah, these sensors has a lot of quirks and features. But uh, given the limited time, I have to pick and choose. Instead of doing time of light, other technologies rely on the concept of triangulation to calculate depths. Triangulation solutions involve uh, two or more uh, viewports that are offset by a constant baseline. And uh, they estimate depths by uh, the difference of how the object appears between the two viewports. This difference in pixels, it's called disparity. And, uh, and the calculation for depth is fairly simple. One important note, interesting uh, feature of uh, triangulation is that if we look at the error in depth, we can see that it, uh, um, it scales with uh, depth squared. So what this practically means is that any triangulation-based sensor will have some uh, recommended um, range of operation. And once you get be beyond that range, the error will just blow up and uh, you will not see anything useful. One way you could uh, control that effect is by increasing the baseline, so basically making your sensor bigger, and this can definitely help. But at the same time, we want small robots, small sensors, small everything. Um, the two uh, <coughs> main triangulation-based uh, technologies are structured light and stereoscopic vision. In structured light, um, you have a projector and a camera, and they're offset by some baseline. And uh, the sensor is projecting a fixed hard-coded pattern into the environment, and is calculating depths based on how the geometry of the environment is distorting this uh, fixed pattern. So basically, for every pixel in the pattern, it finds it where it uh, falls on the on the image, and that way calculates the depths based on triangulation. In case of stereo, you don't project anything, but you have two viewports, and uh, instead of using some fixed known pattern, what you do is you actually trying to find patterns in the image itself. So we're trying to, f to find uh, interesting features and find where they are located in both images. And this lets you calculate based on triangulation the depths. So these two very related solutions produce very different uh, characteristics. In case of structured light, the accuracy is usually pretty good because the pattern is very high contrast and uh, it's very dense in texture. It's basically controlled. You know, you're controlling what you're projecting. Um, and the power is better than time of light because you don't need to illuminate every pixel, just the, one, the, the white ones where you have uh, you know, some pattern. But it suffers from the same problems as time of flight. So if you have two structured light sensors, they will definitely interfere with each other. And if you take structured light sensor outdoor, uh, 
the sun will be a problem. Stereo, on the other hand, you can do without projecting anything in a completely passive way. And this means that multi-camera is a no-brainer out of the box and power is great because you just need two cameras. And also because you're relying on the features that are inside the image, the more light you have, the better. So you can take it outdoor and it will work great. Accuracy depends on, first of all, accuracy depends on what you see and if, uh, if the scene has sufficient amount of uh, interesting features. But it also, um, it also depends on how well your algorithm can identify and match these features. <coughs> now, one uh, problem that uh, made uh, stereo uh, pretty much impractical uh, up until recently is that in order to get a dense uh, depth image, you actually need to solve a dense image uh, registration problem, which is quite heavy in terms of uh, computational resources. And it's not something you would uh, generally want to do without some uh, kind of hardware acceleration. Some solve this problem with a GPU, and there's, there are other solutions that we'll see. So uh, we at RealSense have a lot of experience with all kinds of uh, depth sensing technologies. And I will use a couple of examples to demonstrate some of the points. The SR300 uh, is an advanced structured light sensor that relies not just on one, but on several different patterns that it projects very fast to generate one depth image. What this gives is uh, pretty high accuracy. You can see all the details in the fingers and the uh, uh, folds in the jacket. But uh, where it breaks down, uh, where all structured light sensors kind of break down, is when you take it outdoor. <laughs> Once uh, you're outdoor, um, the, the sunlight washes out all the pattern that, is, that the camera is trying to project. And uh, even if the object is very close, you just can't see anything. <laughs> now, since we are all interested in stuff like self-driving cars and uh, autonomous delivery drones, working outdoor is a good idea. So that's where stereo comes in. And you can see the effect is dramatic. You know, instead of getting just a couple of pixels of uh, distance, now you have uh, the entire scene mapped. Um, this is the D400 depth cameras that we released last year. Um, it combines characteristics of uh, stereoscopic matching with structured light, which allows it to work well indoor, outdoor, in bright sunlight, and uh, in dark environments. And uh, the other cool, cool thing about this, uh, this camera is that it uh, solves the computational barrier by having a dedicated VPU, a dedica dedicated ASIC, designed to do the depth stereo matching. So that the compute on the, on the host platform is minimal. Using this technology, you could easily build a, a robot capable of uh, autonomous navigation using the tools that uh, we saw in the previous, uh, uh, previous talks. <coughs> However, if at any point the camera is blocked for some reason, um, it's very likely uh, that the robot will lose tracking. This is what's, uh, well, what was mentioned as a hijacked robot problem. And uh, one way to work around it is to integrate an IMU. An IMU is a collection of sensors um, containing accelerometer, which measures the total forces acting on a 
on the device at any given time, and a gyroscope which uh, measures angular velocity, and it might <coughs> contain some other sensors. And uh, the first thing that you uh, can do with an IMU is you can get it into one of the well-known IMU filters. IMU filters are getting uh, accelerometer, you know, forces, and uh, uh, angular velocities, and combining them into orientation. And this way, like in this video, the camera can actually understand how it is moving. With all this data, we can now plug it into any of the open source existing SLAM solutions, and we've seen quite a few. The one we chose for this demo is uh, RTABMAP. It's a visual odometry system based on descriptor matching uh, that also incorporates optical flow. Um, it also can perform a loop closure using a, a graph algorithm. It's constantly building a graph of the areas where it uh, visited. And what once it uh, detects that it has been in certain place before, it will propagate the, this discovery back to correct the previous detections. So in this case, we are just moving through the cubicle area. And we're not doing anything sophisticated. This is just pretty much the camera, ROS, RTAB map, without any additional filtering or anything like that. And we're pretty quickly getting a interesting 3D, three-dimensional map of the environment, which can be quite uh, important if you have uh, robots that need to understand, you know, if there's a gap uh, between the floor and the door, or if there's some 3D structure in the way that it can maneuver around. And now, I hope you saw the, this point in time where it finished the loop and connected the map. This is uh, an example of loop closure. So in order to combine and uh, have all this running in ROS, this is pretty much the detailed structure of uh, nodes and uh, topics that you would need. And uh, if we simplify, you can look at it like this. So we talked about the depth camera, we talked about the IMU data, going into the IMU filter, both feeding into RTAB map, and producing a pose in the map. And uh, we actually have this pretty well documented in our wiki. So uh, <coughs> if you want to learn more and uh, uh, try this, the URL is behind the QR code. Now, this is nice. But uh, something is still missing. I mean, we started with this very complicated problem of dense image registration for stereo matching. And we solved it by designing a dedicated hardware that is capable of um, addressing this, uh, this problem. And then we piled up a bunch of additional computer vision modules on top of it just to have uh, mapping, <coughs> which in a way defeats the purpose. So uh, this is exactly why, just last week, uh, we have announced a new type of tracking camera. So this is very similar to other RealSense devices, but instead of calculating depths on, uh, on board, it actually calculates SLAM on board. And instead of providing distances, it provides the sixth of uh, pose of the, of the device itself. Um, it's based on visual odometry with relocalization. And just to give you a taste, now we have, we have uh, liftoff. So this is the camera attached to a drone. 
and uh, being used as an alternative source of navigation um, where GPS is not available. Um, so this is pretty much how it, uh, how it works. It uh, constantly mapping the visual features in the scene and reporting back the, the 3D position. And uh, once it goes down for landing, we can see the, the performance and the loop closure and all that. And uh, obviously it will also work for other robotic applications and uh, we tried it uh, in areas like VR. Here the drone is doing like a forward, fast forward motion and then coming back. And now we are going for landing. And that's it. So um, I have a couple of these devices uh, with me here. Let me see if uh, this will work. Mm, how do I present it to the other screen? Sorry. So this is the SR300 that I was uh, starting with, the structured light sensor. And you can see that it does what it's expected to do. This is the D400. So uh, this one is the one that we're giving away at the end of the talk. We also recently added a, a variant of D400 with an IMU. Um, and I hope that uh, by the end of the talk, we are going to have the T265, the tracking camera here, but uh, I don't see our demo guy. <laughs> so if you're interested to, to see the, the new stuff, uh, stick around and uh, talk to us and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, something working here in short matter of time. And uh, with that out of the way, yeah, we can do the raffle. Yeah. If anyone has questions, yeah. The slam in the new camera is based on the app No, it's uh, actually uh, something that we developed in house. It's uh, using two fisheye cameras and an IMU. Um, it's relatively low power solution. Um, we'll, we'll have to see how it uh, holds up against the big ones. <laughs> well, that's exactly the stereo error going quadratic. It depends on the application. Uh, we chose to uh, go to broad market with this uh, five centimeters uh, five centimeter baseline modules because it's very convenient to mount on a drone. Hey, T265. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, actually, it's very easy to scale stereo-based solutions, and we have prototypes that are uh, using larger baselines and even something like this that uh, can see tens of meters. Yes? So how, how, how far do you see with the five centimeters? Well, it depends on the use case. Uh, I wouldn't use it beyond four meters, and uh, for like fine features, you know, uh, face, it's one, two meters. Which kind of uh, computer did you use for the 3D slam? Show a second. Uh, it's based on the Intel uh, uh, Myriad board, um, so it has several low-power cores uh, with. Uh, single instruction, multiple data type of optimization. So uh, for depths, it's actually not so good to have wide field of view because you're stretching a lot of pixels over large, uh, large area. But for SLAM, 
it is very useful to be able to see more features and to make sure that uh, you know you continue tracking even when you go through doors and uh, you know go from inside to outdoor in these type of scenarios if you would have a narrow field of your camera it would be immediately blinded and then you would have to rely too heavily on the <coughs> mute well yeah basically uh, it's better for the visual part of the odometry. Okay. Um, so we'll do the demo? <coughs> sure. Uh, but. Um, well, I, pref I prefer that uh, who whoever wants to see the, the demo will come to us. Because uh, I'm not sure I can connect it to the Mac. I have a spare laptop. Uh, In this case, let's do the raffle. First. Yeah, let's do the raffle and then we'll come and uh, yeah, see exactly. the new stuff. So we are okay. All right. So, um, <laughs> okay. Uh, Right. So, um, the, 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 what we said, we'll just do the raffle first. Um, everyone is here, then there is a demo, you can come and see it. Uh, and then, yeah. <laughs> and, so, what we'll do, we have uh, how many responses? responding we really really appreciate the fact that you took the time um, it's really important for us to um, to get information oh. uh, um, it's really important for us to get information on the, on the start on how we're doing and the only way we can do that is if we get feedback from you so um, give me a number between one and 56. 38. 36. Who's at 17? <laughs> All right. Who is number 17? Alex Shani. Oh, it's me. <laughs> Congratulations, Alex. It wasn't you who said 17, right? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Alex, and thank you everybody for uh, participating and giving us your information. Thanks for Intel. And thank you to Intel as well. It's, the, it's, the, it's an awesome new camera, not the latest one, but one of the one of the best ones. I want one. Give me one also. <laughs> okay, uh, here you go. Okay. All right, so the, the, the demo of uh, the tracking model, the camera with all the algorithm inside is over here, so you can actually come over and see it on the laptop because it's... Uh, yeah, it's, it's basically a mobile thing, so it's uh, easier to showcase where when people can play with it and see that it comes back to the The device itself is this one, and it's like uh, one of the, the, the 10 first ones that we got manufactured, so... It was kind of challenging to get one. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for, for bringing it here. It's pretty awesome. Can, maybe you can, one thing you can do, you can take Something a walk later and then actually connect it to the screen so everyone can see. Yeah. Ah, because of that. the original trajectory that I did uh, before, but basically this is the walk to, to the right, and this is the stage, and then the jump back. Um, now it's tracking from the zero again. Clear that? Yeah. Well, 
basically uh, it just tracks its own movement. Um, and all, all the computation is on this uh, camera yeah. itself, right? What about ro rotation? Uh, rotation as well? Or well, the rotation use case is more challenging than the general case, uh, but. Uh, we hope that it will work better than most of the things that are available. So we hope that people will see its capabilities and uh, uh, test its limits. Does it also build a map? Sorry? Does it build a map? Well, uh, it builds an internal map that it can use later to relocalize uh, when it gets back to original position. <coughs> Right now, we are not providing the features of the map. It's basically a sparse depth mm -hmm. representation. We might be able to add it at some point later. And also, uh, it is built to work with, with a depth camera, actually with any depth camera. It has an higher, uh, higher cut filter, so it will not get confused by the different uh, structured light uh, you know, sh shenanigans. So you can buy any depth camera and uh, use it to map uh, the environment. So can you explain how they work together? Uh, well, yeah, you, you can use uh, uh, the... Is it, is it required to use that to together with another? Um, no, uh, if all you need is the positional tracking, you can use that just the device. If you want to build a dense 3D reconstruction of the environment, you can use the, this device together with a camera and uh, build the map using depth data with the poses from the device. It will both uh, offload a lot of the computation from the CPU to these two devices. And also we hope uh, will provide better tracking that you would have in the open source. If anyone is still here, uh, I would say while uh, the demo is being started that uh, uh, if there's any exceptional people around here who's looking for an employment in a robotics company, uh, you should talk to the guys wearing this. Uh, we're looking for some uh, yeah. uh, extraordinary people. So. This is a combination. This is a combination of uh, Altav map. It's an open source, and it get, it gets its odometry from the TM2 and the depth cloud from the uh, D435. Let's see if it works. Uh, well, it's an entire lab of this case. 
I mean, we just announced the thing. Uh, oh, it's, 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 it's a problem. I think I'll need this video to see. Thank you for everyone.